Oh, Martin, I have a, a really ridiculous, somewhat uh, childish request to make. Martin, you know that you're more than a butler to me. You're more like a lovable brother who just happens to wait on us. And anyway, I was wondering if there's I'd any... accompany you on the trip, make it a bit easier for Would you. Would you, Martin? Thank you so much. I'd be so grateful. And you don't even have to come as our butler, just as a friend. Madam, I'd be honoured. On March 16, 2009, Natasha Richardson, a Tony Award-winning Broadway actress and star of countless movies from the 90s and 2000s like The Parent Trap and Made in Manhattan, took a ski trip to Mont Tremblant Resort in Quebec. Although she grew up Hollywood royalty, she's the daughter of acting legend Vanessa Redgrave and Oscar-winning director Tony Richardson, Natasha was no expert skier. Given her inexperience, Natasha opted for a lesson with a ski instructor on the bunny hill. At around noon, while nearing the bottom of a beginner's trail, Natasha fell and banged her head against the hard-packed snow. Although Natasha shrugged off the spill, her instructor was concerned enough to get a second opinion from the ski patrol, who actually called for an ambulance. But Natasha insisted she was fine and even signed a waiver declining medical help from paramedics and simply walked back to her room at the Hotel Quintessence. From there, she even made light of the whole incident in a call to her husband, actor Liam Neeson, who was in Toronto shooting a film, telling him, Oh, darling, I've taken a tumble in the snow. It was the last time he'd speak to his wife. I'm Derek Kaufman. I'm Jason Beckerman. And this is Last Days, Natasha Richardson. After that phone call with her husband, Liam Neeson, things started to go downhill quickly. Natasha complained of a headache and started showing signs of confusion, signaling that the injury she suffered from the fall had been more serious than she initially thought. A second ambulance was summoned around 3 p.m., and this time the dispatcher indicated an increased level of urgency. At a hospital in nearby St. Agathe, Richardson actually started to rally, showing promising vital signs and breathing more easily with the help from supplemental oxygen. But she was still disoriented, and hospital staff at the small facility quickly realized they weren't really equipped to handle what was becoming a dire situation. Just before 6 p.m., Richardson was taken to a trauma center in Montreal, around 55 miles away from St. Agath Hospital. So, Jason, by this point, Liam Neeson had received word that the situation was quite serious, so he left his Toronto film production to join his wife in Montreal. He finally was ushered into a hospital room, found his wife hooked up to a life support machine, and received the grim news from the medical staff. His wife was brain dead and had no hope of recovery. Years later, he'd opened up to Anderson Cooper on 60 Minutes about his last moments with Natasha in the hospital. I was told she was brain dead. I'm seeing this x-ray. It was like, wow. Yeah. But obviously she was on life support and stuff. And I went into her. and I just uh, told her I loved her. said, sweetie, you're not coming back from this. Uh, you've banged your head. It's... I don't know if you can hear me, but it's, this is what's gone down. And we're bringing you back to New York. All your family and friends will come. And that was more or less it, you know. And in that same interview, I guess he went on to describe the, I can't, the unimaginable decision, right? To yeah. remove her from life support? Yeah, he said the two of them had made a pact earlier to do so if either of them ended up in such a dire situation. You can imagine this. You're married, I'm married. I've had this discussion with Mary before that if I'm in a position where I'm not going to recover, don't, don't leave me there to suffer. And that's exactly what Liam Neeson did, although being in the actual moment and doing so has got to be the most difficult decision in the world. She and I had made a pact. If any of us got into a vegetative state, we pulled the plug, you know? So when I saw her and saw all these tubes and stuff, uh, that was my immediate thought was, okay, these, these tubes have to go. She's gone. Um, donated three of her organs, so she's keeping three people alive at the moment. Yeah, Her heart, her kidneys, and her liver. Natasha was eventually transported to New York, where she was pronounced dead on March 18th. She was just 45 years old. On March 19th, theater lights were dimmed on Broadway and Manhattan and in the West End on London as a mark of respect for her acting career. A private funeral was held at St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Millbrook, New York, near the family's upstate home, where Richardson was finally laid to rest near her maternal grandmother. A little over a year later, her aunt, Lynn Redgrave, died from breast cancer at the age of 67 and was buried in the same churchyard. So, Jason, this was an absolute tragedy when it happened. And the the real story here is how a simple fall tumbled into this 
tragic event. And so the autopsy is fascinating in this instance. The final report revealed that the blunt impact from the fall tore a cranial artery, resulting in massive bleeding in the area between Richardson's skull and the lining that covers your brain. The official cause of death was listed as an epidural hematoma. Essentially, that's a massive brain hemorrhage or brain bleed that causes the blood to pool in an area of your brain. It kills the surrounding cells and leads quickly to death. If treated quickly with brain surgery, it's sometimes possible to save a patient's life who suffered this type of injury. But Richardson's initial decision to decline the medical treatment on the mountain and simply head back to her hotel room proved actually to be fatal. And this is quite common, unfortunately, with this type of injury. Dr. David Langer, who's the director of the Cerebrovascular Neurosurgery Unit at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital and assistant professor at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, said people who suffer brain injuries like this often have a, quote, lucid interval. Uh, that, that means basically when you're on the mountain, you suffer that head injury, you're not disoriented. You're actually quite fine and you feel like you can move on with your day. Um, but the bleeding is still ongoing in your head, and it continues to clot in the area, which eventually grows big enough to press on the brain and kill the surrounding cells. Epidural hematomas do show up on CAT scans, and surgery is typically recommended within an hour to relieve the built-up pressure and stop the bleeding. And if that happens, many patients do go on to a full recovery. So what happened in Natasha Richardson really was a, a tragic confluence of events, several most unlikely, I think, that led to her eventual death. First, she was not wearing a helmet at the time, and the tear to her cranial artery must have resulted from hitting the head on something very hard at precisely the wrong angle. You really need to have a laceration of the artery to cause the bleeding that leads to this type of deadly epidural hematoma. It was spring skiing, so there's some speculation that snow melt and refreezing could have led to icy conditions and compacted snow, which is much harder than powder. Anybody who has done spring skiing and has skied on the icy conditions that are common in the spring knows how hard that can be. You're always much more afraid to fall, you know, and hit your rear end or your arm or whatever it is during spring skiing than you are. And I want I want to emphasize she was on a, a bunny hill, a training yeah. hill, so she, she wasn't was much without of a, a helmet, skier. and she wasn't much of a skier, right? And she was the fact she was without a hel out a helmet just to uh, digress just for a second. She became sort of the cautionary tale that when I would take my kids skiing, it's what I think about, honestly. Yeah. And I mean, obviously my kids wear, wear helmets. I think most people, now most people on the mountain do, but anybody you see without it, it's immediately Natasha Richardson that goes through through people's heads. And it's sort of the common thing that people talk about. It, it, as, as tragic as it was for her, maybe that's sort of the... The legacy of her the accident. silver line, it's caused it, a lot it, more it people really to wear has. helmets. It's caused a lot more, exactly right. So in addition to the fact that she wasn't wearing her helmet, the hospitals in the area were not equipped to deal with such a serious brain injury, and getting her to the right facility in Montreal simply took too long. As the situation became more dire, she was taken to the trauma center, but a 55-mile drive takes time, and each passing moment only worsened her condition as the bleeding continued to damage her brain. By the time she got to the trauma center, it was too late, and Neeson even described seeing an MRI image showing her being her brain being, quote, squashed up against the side of her skull. And you can imagine this. The, the ski towns are often small. They're yep. just there for a mountain and some people to ski and maybe a small town with a, a cafe or something, but these are not the center of a metropolitan well, what, area with a huge, great hospital. What you, what you will find are the finest orthopedic surgeons in the world in ski towns. It's what That's you right. see all the time. If you, if you break your arm or break your leg or do something awful to something, you will find the greatest orthopedic surgeons in the world in Vail and Aspen and places like that because that is where they go for those type of traumas which happen every single day on the mountains. What you don't have are a lot of brain surgeons. You don't yeah. have those people who treat very things that don't happen very often and that there's just, you know, not a great need for them, thankfully. Yeah. Um, but you do have these great orthopedic surgeons. You have hospitals, and obviously orthopedic surgeons are capable of addressing emergency situations, but they don't have the expertise. They don't see this kind of thing all, all the time. The the, the third, the, this is really interesting. The, the third real event that, that cost her her life is that the injury didn't seem particularly bad at the time. And ironically, a more serious fall really could have saved her life. As mentioned, she was on that beginner trail. You just mentioned that. And with an instructor, so the fall did not seem so serious. She got up, declined the medical intervention, and apparently thought she could simply recover back in her room. If she'd been skiing a more difficult stretch in the mountain or taken a really hard fall, it's quite possible her injuries would have seemed more significant, which may have led to paramedics immediately taking her to the hospital or in the, or in the ski, CT scan. 
to check for brain injuries and then performing emergency surgery, which could have saved her life. This is what is so scary about what happened to Natasha Richardson. And we've done a lot of these where, you know, there's rampant drug use and it seems very dangerous in the moment what you're doing. Here, it didn't seem that dangerous. She was on the bunny hill. She wasn't even wearing a helmet, maybe because she was on a bunny hill and yep. didn't think she could suffer such a spill. If she had hit a tree or if she had taken a tumble that was very, very bad, it might not have even been within her power to refuse medical treatment. They might have come up to her and said, wow, you're in bad shape. That was a really bad fall. I saw it. I'm taking you to the hospital yep. here. It was kind of like on a, a, a you know, injury on a sports field where you say, hey, can you shake it off and get back in the game? It looked like she could shake it off. And unfortunately, that just allowed the brain bleed to to get to a level where it became dire. Yeah. So she she was such a prominent woman, uh, actress in, in our lives. I mean, Parent Trap is such a legendary movie. movie. Uh, what else? Well, a huge legacy left behind. Broadway actress, really supremely talented. Yeah. You know, it's hard to identify someone with a more impeccable pedigree for ensuring success in Hollywood. Obviously, we're at a moment right now where we're talking a lot about nepotism and all that sort of stuff. You know, Natasha Richardson is Hollywood royalty. Uh, she was born in 1963 in London to the Redgrave family. And for those who are unfamiliar, her mother, Vanessa Redgrave, is one of only 15 women to win the Triple Crown of Acting, taking home two Emmy Awards, a Tony Award, and of course an Oscar for her supporting actress win in the movie Julia. Her aunt, Lynn Redgrave, and uncle, Corin Redgrave, are also accomplished actors. And her father on her <laughs> the other side of her family tree, Tony Richardson, was an accomplished producer and director in his own right, who also took home an Oscar for directing Tom Jones. Even Natasha's sister, Jolie Richardson, is an accomplished actress herself, appearing in numerous movies and even playing King Henry VIII's sixth and final wife, Catherine Parr, in the Showtime series, The Tudors. So this is really second to none. I mean, there's the Barrymores and there's the Redgraves. And then she also marries uh, one of the biggest actors of our generation, right? She marries Liam Neeson and, you know, I guess solidifies even more the fact that she is Hollywood royalty. Absolutely. So Richardson cut her teeth in the acting world in London's West End, making her first professional appearance alongside her mother in a revival of Anton Chekhov's The Seagull in 1985. From there, she would continue her stage career on Broadway, starring in the title role of a production of Anna Christie, where she met Liam Neeson, her future husband. Her big break came when she played Sally Bowles in Sam Mendes' revival of Cabaret, and she eventually took home the Tony Award for Best Actress in a Musical. Although she'd move on to roles in film... She, her first love was always stage acting. Just two months before her death, she was in a production of Stephen Sondheim's A Little Night Music, co-starring again with her mother. The two were preparing to co-star in a broader revival of the musical that never happened due to her death. You're, you're a bit of a, a Broadway fan yourself. Yeah. It, she's a big, big name oh, in, she's, in stage acting. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure she's on the Mount Rushmore, but she's on whatever. If they were to expand Mount Rushmore from four to ten, <laughs> she's I around think there. She, she'd be there. She's, she, she's in the mountain range. She's a, big, a, a, she's a big part of the scene of Broadway through the 90s and 2000s. She was a, a really, really big deal. Absolutely. So on the big screen, though, Richardson starred in the title title role of Paul Schrader's Patty Hearst movie about the heiress and her kidnapping. This was her real big break. She leveraged that success into other roles, including starring alongside Robert Duvall and Faye Dunaway in The Handmaid's Tale. But it was her role in a 1998 Disney remake of The Parent Trap, alongside a precocious Lindsay Lohan, that really introduced Richardson to an entirely new generation. I guess you have to switch us back now, huh? Well, technically... You belong to your dad, and Annie belongs to me. His and hers, kids. No offense, Mom, but this arrangement really sucks. I agree, it totally sucks. Now, I, I don't want to overstate it, because the movie obviously belongs to Lindsay Lohan. This is what really launched Lindsay Lohan, but... In iconic movies like this, the parents also become iconic themselves. Dennis Quaid is the role of the of the father, Natasha Richardson, and they really help the movie. The movie has a lot of heart at its center, and you can only have the antics of the kids running around if you have that anchor of, of the parents. I think the importance of this movie is that uh, everybody who works in this podcast, other than you and me, is considerably younger than we are. Yes. And uh, when we were talking about doing Nat Natasha Richardson, we got a lot of blank stares until we said the mom from The Parent Trap, and then everybody lit up and was <laughs> delighted that we were doing this, that we were coming covering her because they all know her from that. It, it, like you said at the top, it introduced her to an entirely new generation of yeah. fans. It was sad when some of them said, oh, what happened to her? And I was <laughs> like, oh, you'll find out on the episode. In any event, she turns this memorable comedic performance into further movies, uh, Waking Up in Reno and Made in Manhattan with Jennifer Lopez. And she really sort of kickstarted a career where she's in a lot of big movies that you've seen, maybe not in the starring role, but she's there and she's always adding value. 
So in her personal life, Richardson raised millions of dollars for AIDS research after her father passed away from the disease in 1991. And although she eventually quit cigarettes herself after many years as an avid smoker, Richardson was an outspoken critic of the ban on smoking in New York City restaurants. In a three-page appeal sent to city officials, including Mayor Rudy Giuliani at the time, she wrote, quote, Please, sir, ease up. Redirect your efforts. There are many citizens in this city, as well as visitors from all over the world, who do not mind being in the presence of other people's smoke. They are just not as vocal as the righteous anti-smoking brigade who will not rest until the few beleaguered smokers who remain are relegated to grabbing a desperate fix on a windblown street corner or must be content to stay at home and not visit the fabulous restaurants and bars of our city. Jason, I love this. I included this anecdote for you. It's such a contrarian kind of viewpoint in this. You never ever hear anybody saying you this. never hear this but remember she's british she's yeah. from the the famous red gray family so she liked smoking yeah. she loves smoking in restaurants and when these changes started to sweep through new york city there was a very vocal contingent of which natasha richardson was a part that said hey people don't mind yeah. if i'm smoking in a restaurant don't blow it for the rest of us i love the language she used yes. it gives you a sense that she was this brassy funny unapologetic sort of person because What's hard to glean from it, if you just know her from the parent trap as the mom to Lindsay Lohan, you lose sight of uh, how interesting she was as a person. You hear the Britishisms throughout this letter, right? It is so, the the language she uses is so pointed and perfect. She's really great. I appreciate you including that in there. That was Myself, a cigarette contrarian to a lot of people, (laughs) I appreciate this. That's right. So although her acting legacy and pedigree really stand beyond reproach, Perhaps the most important part of Richardson's legacy will be the two young sons she left behind when she passed away in 2009. David, who was just 12 at the time, and Michael, who was 13, um, really tried to pick up the pieces from the devastating loss of their mother. David decided not to follow in his famous family's acting footsteps, instead starting an environmentally friendly clothing line called Pine Outfitters. He told the New York Post in 2019 that he actually drew inspiration to take the leap into a new business from something his mother told him, which was, quote, don't ever feel like you ever have to be forced down a tunnel to fit in. Do what you want to do, but do it to your best and be generous with it. Michael, her other son, however, did enter the family business of acting, eventually starring opposite his father in a 2020 comedy drama called Made in Italy about a father and son who cope with the loss of the wife and mother who bound them together. It was a smaller film, but it's clear from the trailer that the themes hit very close to home for both men. I heard about your mother, Jack. I'm sorry. I don't remember anything. You can't remember her, and I can't forget. You know, this is not a huge movie. I'm not going to overstate what it was, but it was very personal to both Michael and Liam. And Michael said the film offered him a way to reflect on the loss of his mother, telling Vanity Fair in 2020 that being around the film crew is where he felt his mother's presence most. And as a matter of fact, Jason, Michael said that he watches The Parent Trap over and over again because he says the portrayal of his mother in that movie is actually the closest to her in real life, and it makes him feel just close to her. So the counterfactual here, Derek, assuming that she doesn't perish on the hillside on that day or in her hospital later on, or in the, uh, what becomes of her career? Clearly a, an established Broadway actress. I don't know how many movie roles she had left in her future, although she may very well, given that Liam Neeson after this time became a huge action star with the Taken series and otherwise, she may easily have uh, sort of gotten into into those sorts of roles and, and there's no reason she couldn't have. She's still a very young woman. Um, but her real legacy, I think, is on Broadway and I think the counterfactual is she continued to be a dominant presence on the stage, both in London and in New York for decades to come. She really just, again, to the point we were making earlier, was one of those people she could get any role that she wanted, fitting her you know, gender and age. She could have any role that she wanted. Um, and she seemed well inclined to continue to take those roles uh, for the rest of her career. Yeah, one thing I wonder with her is how her death impacted Liam Neeson's career. Because if you think of Liam Neeson, who was her, her spouse, um, early in his career, he was doing movies like Schindler's List. He was a very serious, dramatic actor. And I wonder if the influence of Natasha Richardson on his career was to make him in that mold, sort of a serious actor. When she passed, he moved to more action fare, uh, maybe less weighty roles, which are certainly lucrative, but it's interesting to think about his career kind of diverging in that direction rather than staying on that Schindler's List sort of path. I wonder if being part of the Red Grave family in that closely, that in that close proximity to so many Oscar winners would have kept him chasing that goal rather than moving in another direction. I, I just think when you have that sort of trauma, when your life gets turned completely upside down like that, you probably reach out for something different, try to explore new things. I mean, I can't imagine the the uh, tragedy and having to deal with that for, and especially with two young children at home. I'm sure he 
decided to take on different pursuits and, uh, you know, good for him for, for doing it. I think you're right. I think she would have stuck with with Broadway uh, ultimately because that was her true passion. I, I think we'd see reunions with Lindsay Lohan. There's a lot that we're missing just as a result of her passing, which is unfortunate. I wanted to leave the final word, though, with Alan Cumming. You, you know Alan Cumming, right? Sure. He starred with Natasha Richardson in a Broadway production of Cabaret. And what he had to say about her was really sort of fitting a tribute to her as a person and as an actress. He said, I, like everyone, am totally devastated by the sudden death of Natasha Richardson. The term life force seems trite, but that is what she was, a woman who powered through life and fascinated everyone she encountered. I've been thinking about the times I spent with her since I heard the news of her tragic accident, and the strongest memory I have is of her laughter, her unmistakable throaty laugh. I think that's a great way to remember someone. She was a brilliant actress. I'll never forget her Blanche Dubois. It was almost too much, too real and raw. Liam and the boys and her whole family have lost an amazing woman. We all have. Goodbye, darling. 